Unfolding the eternal excellences, the hidden insights of the truth and the depth of the riches of wisdom and knowledge. The Bible says, I have cleansed thee by the word. I have not pointed to your weaknesses. He says, I have cleansed thee by the word. I have pointed to your strength. And this is your strength, that I am Christ in you, the hope of glory. The glory of freedom, the glimpses into eternity. The gospel is not supposed to be an assumption. It's not supposed to be just a mere presupposition. Truth is older than language, but the Word of God is way deeper than any human language. And now, Apostle Grace with the Word. Hagar chapter 2, verses 5. Now if you read of a word, it was in the 21st day of the month, in the 7th month on the 21st. Um, the word of the Lord came to the prophet Haggai concerning Zerubbabel, the son of Shittil, the governor of Judah, and to Joshua, the son of Jezebel. And if you know Haggai and Zechariah, which by reference in scripture are called minor prophets. And I tell people that they're not called minor because they have a minor role in scripture. But they are called minor because they wrote a little. And so that was just used for referential purposes in scripture. But not necessarily um, divine purpose. Some people think that the references of scripture can be used in the offices. Um, but that is not right. You cannot say I'm a major apostle. <laughs> so then how do I tell the minor one? You understand what I'm saying? Because truthfully thinking about it, I don't know what the other apostle was called to do. So what makes me think that I'm major when I don't know the purpose for which God has ordained them for? What if God has sent them to 120 people? Are you following what I'm saying? And they do their work so well with the 120 and I'm called for 10,000 and I do my work in the 3,000 and I don't fulfill the work with the 7. Does that make me major? You understand what I'm saying? So we leave that to the working of God who calleth men. Um, because by scripture, when we talk about mine and major prophets here, we are using reference uh, for people to easily identify with specific works of scripture, but not necessarily in the dimension of divine purpose concerning these ones. Because when Haggai comes, he does what God calls him to do and he does it to the fullest. Praise God. We all labor for this one thing, that we might finish what God ordained us for, that we might do what God called us to do, and that we might do it to the fullest. You understand what I'm saying? It's that simple. We want to do what God called us to do, and we all do it to the fullest. Whether you are an usher, whether you're a security person, whether you're playing your piano, you're the choir, there is no mind and major worshiper. We're all worshippers of God. You understand what I'm saying? And we're all tagged against what destiny God has ordained us for. Say, hey guy, and Zechariah come in as the minor by reference prophets, but those that God sends to Israel to rekindle their passion and direction in rebuilding the temple. And uh, the work of God that had been stalled for years by the enemies of the north and many other things, now God is trying to recollect Israel that Israel will reconstruct the story of destiny as a nation. And in verse 5, the Bible says, According to the word that I covenanted with you when you came out of Egypt, so my spirit remaineth among you, fear ye not. Hallelujah. And so God, as he's speaking through the prophet Haggai, he takes them back to the experience of the time he was with them while they were still in bondage in Egypt as the children of Israel. And when they were still in bondage, he made a covenant and he spoke to them. And he says, according to the word that I covenanted with you when they came out of Egypt, when they crossed from Egypt and came into the world, there is a promise God gave them. Are you hearing me? And he's telling them, from then on, a lot has passed, things have shifted, attacks have come, changes have taken place from the time you came out of Egypt. And he says, and I covenanted the word toward you. I promised you something. I said something. And we entered the covenant with you, with your holy prophets then Moses. And he says, and because of that, up to today, my spirit remaineth with you. 
and he tells them, fear not. Hundreds of years have taken place. But somehow, Israel has gone to a point where they have almost given up on some of the things God has spoken because they're not coming to pass and generations are dying and getting born and other generations are dying and getting born and the word of God as he had promised them is not coming to pass. They're not seeing it coming to manifestation. And so there's a caution. Sometimes you can wait on God for so long. People wait on God for so long and sometimes they don't see the answers and time is passing, you know, miles are traveled and many things are spent but they still don't see God and they start to question what are you up to, where are we going, what is this taking us to and what is the direction of the course of what you think is for us, help us understand. So Israel was in this desperate state and then God tells them, look, when I covenant with you, I sent my spirit according to the covenant that I gave. And he said, even though many of the fulfillments of these things have not come to your manifestation because of certain reasons, which again I'm going to go so deep into, he says, better still, my spirit still remaineth among you. That means that the spirit of God is tugged to the covenant he has with you. Are you hearing me? The spirit of God is present to the covenant he has made with you. And this can be as general as a church. This can be as general as the body of Christ. But this can even get personal to you. The things she spoke to you when I wasn't there, when nobody next to you was. But it still says that the things that I spoke to you, if I promised you and I said that I'm going to do this, be rest assured that wherever I place the covenant with you, my spirit still remaineth. That means he places oil, he places an anointing, he places his spirit on anything he has covenanted with a man. Are you hearing me? There are promises he made to me as Grace Rebecca when he was calling me in the gospel. And yes, a lot of things happen. Turbulence has come attacks come, things go up and sometimes things go down. But in spite of all those things, I see that the Spirit of God remaineth. Somebody shout hallelujah. And because the Spirit of God remaineth, I have the confidence inside there that whatever affliction, whatever attack comes, it's only temporal. Things change. So this is not exactly what I'm trying to tell you. This is for me, but it as well works for every believer here. That if God spoke a word under his covenant with you, it does not matter what happens in your life. He says that the covenant I have made with you when you came out of Egypt, he says my spirit remaineth among you. Somebody shout hallelujah. In other words, my spirit is still present both to fulfill what I promised you, but because also he must be with you as I am with you. Never forget that. Never forget that. That everything God has covenanted with you, the spirit for that thing is available. That means the power is available. That means the glory is available. That means the anointing is available. That means the promise is getting fulfilled. It will get fulfilled. Somebody shout amen. But let me go a bit deeper here. In verse 6 he say to them, For thus saith the Lord of hosts, Yet once it is a little while, and they will shake the heavens, and the earth, and the sea, and the dry land, and I will shake all nations, and the desire of all nations shall come, and I will fill this house with the glory, said the Lord of hosts. He said, Silver is mine, and the gold is mine, said the Lord of hosts. The glory, he says, of this latter house shall be greater than all the former, saith the Lord of hosts. And in this place I will give peace, saith the Lord of hosts. Somebody shout Amen. Common scripture. Common scripture. He says, I am shaking the earth, and I'm shaking the heavens, and the earth, and the sea, and the dry land. And he says, and I will shake the nations, and the desire of all nations shall come, and I will fill this house with glory, says the Lord, and the silver is mine, and the gold is mine, says the Lord of hosts, and the glory, he says, of this latter church, this latter building, this latter house, this latter establishment, this latter tabernacle, this latter temple, this latter sanctuary, this latter experience, he says, it shall be greater than of the former, saith the Lord of hosts. And in this place I will give peace, saith the Lord of hosts. Somebody shout, Amen. And that's where I want to go. 
That's why I want to dig. God has promised that our time will be greater. He has promised that our time will be greater. It will be greater. It must be greater. It should be greater. It has to be greater. There is no way it cannot be greater. And if this is a solemn covenant with his mouth to say that the glory of your time is going to be greater than the glory of red before in church history, he says, and the spirit to make that possible remaineth among you. Somebody shout hallelujah. Ladies and gentlemen, the spirit that makes that possible remains among us. In other words, we're not asking for the Spirit to fulfill what God has promised for us. We just need to know how to connect to the Spirit that remaineth among us. If we can connect to the Spirit that remaineth among us, then whatever He has promised, we shall see with our very own eyes. Somebody shout Amen. And in this one hour of speaking to you, I am going to labor, to share, to touch, to position us, to provoke us, to convict us, to push us. To the spirit that remaineth among us because of the covenant that the Lord has made. Of course, we still live in a time where the devil has deliberately deluded us and misdirected our focus, our attention, our prayers, our visions, and our hunger to the things of this world because he knows that if he can divert us from the things of God and we stay hungry, for the things of this world our prayers will be touching the things of this world our desires will be touching the things of this world our hunger will be touching the things of this world the things we seek for will be touching for the things of this world and when we get to church our need and prayer is limited our need and prayer is inferior our need and prayer is out of line with God's mind and purpose concerning our lives it's the man who is asking for a plot of land to the same man the Lord gave power to ask of nations. I don't know that you understand what I'm saying. It is to the woman that God told that I shall make thee a mother of nations. And she still thinks that she can be that and fail to find her husband. You understand what I'm saying? It's the things God promises us and when they are long in waiting, sometimes Satan confuses us and starts misleading us into seeking for the things we're not supposed to seek for. And in that then we start to ask for the smallest stuff and then we leave out the most important we start to leave out the deeper stuff we start to leave out the most defining things we stop to hunger for the things that we really need for the things that the spirit that remains is available for who is understand what I'm saying and so even in this period God has impressed it on my heart to really star us to exactly what do we need in God I'm not talking about what you think you need. I'm talking about exactly what you need, what you really need in God. 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 There is a certain place where you get to in God. And the things you thought you need, you realize you don't need. Some people are asking because their vision is small. If I knew the things I know now, 15, 20 years ago, I would not have prayed that way. Are you hearing me? Why? Because I've tested God. I have tested God. Are you hearing me? But there are also things that over the years that I asked for. And I noticed that my peers in that time did not ask for. And I can see their lives. I see the testimonies they have and I can tell in my heart, in my spirit, in the inside there, I know that God answered their desires, what they asked for for God. But I can only tell that they asked for little. Are you hearing me? I just want to provoke you to ask, to pray, to seek for something bigger than your name. Something bigger than your color, something bigger than your family, something bigger than your language, something bigger than you, something bigger than your education, something bigger than your connection, something bigger than your experiences, something bigger than your exposures, something bigger than what you could ever experiment and test 
That is what I want to provoke your spirit for. Because we lose something when the spirit is available to fulfill the bigger picture of God. And we're still asking for things so small. And it doesn't mean that God will not fulfill it. But how long will he continue dealing with us when we are asking for things we don't need? More than the things we need. And our eyes then are taken to open, to understand, to see what we really need in God. So I told people one day I said, when you build a certain relationship with God, a certain relationship, there's a certain relationship, when you build it, there are things you can't ask God for anymore. Or at least, if you should go in prayer, the things you'll ask for from God will be different from the things the normal Christian, the usual Christian, the predictable Christian, the mediocre Christian will ask for. Why? Because the spirit that promised that the glory of the latter shall be greater than the glory of the former, the Bible says he still remaineth with us. And that's when the spirit asks me, what are you doing with that same spirit that is still among you? You must know the tangibility of his presence and the reality of the fact that he is here with us. And I discovered this, that we have not placed the demand on him. Because we don't know the spirit that is among us. We don't know the spirit that is among us. We don't fully understand the spirit that is among us. And so... You'll ask me the question, where do we miss it from? Many aspects of life we do. In many ways we do. But I'll tell you one major one. The Lord spoke to me and said, the realities and truths of divine sovereignty in my people, and for many, these realities are are making sense to them divine sovereignty the sovereignty of god these are truths that we touch that if god chooses to revive us he will if he makes a decision to reform the church he will if he makes up his mind to move he will if he makes up his mind to change people he will if he makes up his mind to uplift people he will yes And many of us then stick on waiting on God to make the decision one day to move. And we wait. Because it's sovereign. Unless God buildeth, the builder buildeth in vain. Unless the Lord watches over his city, the watchman watches over in vain. And so in that we assume that the sovereignty of God is telling us that we have to wait on him to make the decision to move. And so some say, if God chooses to revive his people, you don't need to do anything about it. If God chooses to save his people, you'll not do anything about it. And some of us stick through there. And then we get so hard, committed into prophetic interpretation of scripture, which are all true and applicable in their own times and seasons, and then sometimes we even go beyond even prophecies of scripture to individual prophets and what God gives them in that given time of hour. And it's okay to have all that. It's okay. I believe in all that. I believe in the authority of scripture. I believe in the prophecy of scripture. I believe in the prophets of God. I believe in the sovereignty of God. But God told me, what if these things mute your perspective of human responsibility? What if these things the sovereignty of God, the authority of scripture and prophecies or prophets, mute, kill, take away your perspective of human responsibility. And then, what is the space of human responsibility amidst prophecy? What is the space of human responsibility amidst the word? What is the space of human responsibility in the place and time of God's sovereignty? What if God does not want to move, yet the man is ready to believe God to move? How do we reconcile that? How then can God refuse to move when he has set the laws uh, of the spirit that allow him to move, that must 
move him or he must move over or by in the time when he should and then we get the confusion of if the Lord wills he shall send us power he shall send us the anointing he shall send us the glory we are waiting on him and some people up to today are still waiting on God are you hearing me but then as I started to study the scripture I started to see that human responsibility in history has moved God before even out of his sovereignty and authority of prophetic interpretation prophetic instruction prophetic command we have read experiences in the bible before where god in his sovereignty he has made decisions about things about people about events about affairs and a man out of responsibility places a demand to for god to change something and god changed it because he honored that man or because he honored the faith in the spirit of that man and when i started to see those things i then started to learn that even though the sovereignty of god is a truth infallible all that the scripture and the prophetic utterance of it or the prophets that are sent are all acceptable god has still created the space for the man that is ready to place a demand and believe him for something to act for that man's faith because he respects human responsibility when it touches the divine things somebody shout hallelujah and i'll give you a few examples some of you have read the story of a man called Achaia. The Bible says in 2 Kings chapter 20 from the first verse, the Bible says in those days Hezekiah fell sick. And when Hezekiah fell sick, the Bible says he fell sick and to death. And when Hezekiah fell sick and to death, the prophet Isaiah the son of Amos came to him and said unto him, Thus saith the Lord, set thine house in order, for thou shalt die and not leave. And the Bible says, and then, after Hezekiah had had this, the Bible says, then he turned his face to the wall and prayed unto the Lord. Yes, the Lord has said that put your house in order, you're not going to leave. That's the sovereignty of God. That is a prophetic utterance by God. He has made up his mind to end the man's life. He's not testing him. He has made up his mind. The prophet has come from God and he has said that our plan according to heaven, you're supposed to be dead. Are you hearing me? And the Bible says, and then he turned his face to the wall and prayed unto the Lord, saying, I beseech thee, O Lord, remember now how I have walked before thee in truth and with a perfect heart, and have done that which is good in thy sight. And the Bible says, and Hezekiah wept sore. He wept loud. He wept with a pain in his heart that he was going to die. And the Bible says, and it came to pass, afore, as Isaiah was gone out into the middle court, that the word of the Lord came to him, saying, turn again he didn't even allow him to oh he did not even allow the prophet to go back and have a meal no was the prophet wrong no the prophet could have been told guys before he came to hezekiah and told him you know what the lord has given me no word to go and tell hezekiah that he's going to die and you know if hezekiah didn't die there's probably even people in the middle who say no but the prophet spoke and it did not come to pass that means he's a false prophet no he's not necessarily a false prophet because it did not come to pass no 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 there's a sovereignty of god that even goes beyond the word of the prophet somebody shout amen and the Bible says, and it came to pass, for as Isaiah was gone out into the middle court, that the word of the Lord came unto him, saying, Turn again and tell Hezekiah, the captain of my people, Thus saith the Lord, the God of David, thy father, I have had thy prayer, I have seen thy tears. He says, Behold, I will heal thee, and on the third day thou shalt go up unto the house of the Lord. And I will add unto thy days fifteen years, and I will deliver thee in this city out of the hand of the king of Assyria. And I will defend this city for my own sake and for my servant David's sake. And Isaiah said, Take a lamp of figs. And they took it and laid it on the boil, and he recovered. Actually, the literal word there for recovering is he began to recover. He healed. He started to heal. And Hezekiah said unto Isaiah, What shall be the sign that the Lord will heal me, and that I shall go up into the house of the Lord the third day? And Isaiah said, This sign thou shalt have of the Lord, that the Lord will do the thing that he has spoken. Shall the shadow go forward ten degrees, or go backward ten degrees? And Hezekiah answered, It is a light thing for the shadow to go down ten degrees. Nay, but let the shadow return back ten degrees. And as Isaiah the prophet cried unto the Lord, he broke the shadow ten degrees backward by which it had done in the tile of a house. Because he wanted to prove to this man that I have made up my mind. I have changed 
my mind does go to give you 15 more years and to deliver you from the hand of the Assyrian, which then was not the plan before. But because you prayed, my sovereignty has changed and my mind has been changed concerning a thing. Why? Because the spirit remains. Somebody shout amen. Shout amen. Shout glory to God. And so from then he gave us proof. He gave us living proof that it is possible for me to come out of my own sovereignty and change something if a man can provoke me by prayer. So yes, there are times God has appointed for revival. But even in the times when he has not, if a man is ready to believe God, he can change the world calendar. He can change the dial of history. He can change the calendar of God. He can change the intention of heaven. If a man dares to believe God, he says, if my words abide in you and you abide in me, he says, you shall ask anything in my name. And he said, and it shall be done unto you. Somebody shout, Amen. Glory to God. I used to be provoked, still I am, when I read and imagine what a lot of glory would look like. It just beats me. When I think about it, it just beats me. Men made access float. They tore the mouths of lions. They were valiant in battle. The Bible says women received their dead. And what more shall I say of Samson and Gideon and Jephthah? The Bible speaks of men that spoke to plagues and they responded. The Bible speaks of men that used to lay their bodies on dead bodies and these bodies received life. The Bible speaks of men that slapped waters and they parted. The Bible speaks of men that had strength that they could carry a whole gate of a city up a hill and kill thousands by a jawbone of an ass. And God tells you no. In all of this, he said that the glory of the latter shall be greater than the glory of the former. Moses led more than 300,000 men and built systems, political, social, economic systems that directed the whole nation by one man's anointing. That if God needed to ease his work, he had to share that anointing by 70 men. And when he does, the man still stays anointed. Somebody shout hallelujah. And God tells you that the glory of the latter shall be greater than the glory of the former. The Deborahs that led the barracks in war and they subdued kingdoms by the word of the Lord. The Elishas that would sleep and not worry about Syrian armies surrounding them because they have the anointing to strike a whole army blind. And God says, and the glory of the latter church shall be greater than the glory of the former, saith the Lord. He says, because my spirit remaineth in you it remaineth among you the covenant that i have made shall come to pass the spirit has not left but does the word that i promised to do what are we doing with that spirit somebody shout amen a man wakes up and the bible says he used to pray three times a day and they throw him in a den of lions and no lion can open its mouth no lion can open its mouth to consume him because the anointing that is working on him even these creatures these beasts that are hungry cannot touch this anointed fellow and god said that the glory of the latter church shall be greater than the glory of the former somebody shout amen and these men commanded kingdoms and they spoke to kings and kings listened kingdoms listened men responded and they walked and yielded and gave themselves over because god was speaking something he was leading he was speaking through them army stopped at these men you know kings make decisions to war with people because of these men and it tells you and the glory of the latter shall be greater than the glory of the former shout amen and then we go past time biblical time 
They will go in one AD. Where the church is thriving by the anointing of the Holy Spirit and the cooks, Philip, Stephanus. They're healing people in the marketplaces and raising dead people and casting out devils and opening blind eyes and deaf ears. And he says, uh uh-uh. Even that can become former if you position yourself in the latter. Who has understood what I just said? He said, that also can become former if you position yourself in the latter. Who is understanding what I'm saying? If you position yourself in the latter. And then we get in the 1500s, mid 1500s, when the rumblings of reformations come through. The 1600s, 1800s. We go to the first great awakening where hundreds of thousands of people were awakened. Europe was awakened by the gospel. And God says, uh, uh, that can also be a former. If you place yourself in the latter of now, the spirit still remains among you. We get into the second great awakening of revival through the Grandison Phoenix. Men whose trains passed through New York City and the whole city was slain by the power of God. And God says, that can also be former. And you can place yourself in the latter. And I create a deeper glory than what you saw in Grandison Finney. I read the story of that man and there were times he could start speaking. And literally men are out. They are like dead. Not because he wants them dead. But the spirit was too heavy that men could not contain when they were sitting under the words of that man. And God said, uh-uh. That can still be in the former. I can position you in the latter. But oh, rakotere brosele kende kosere braka talapai. The holiness movement, the layman revivals, where there was no specific leader of movement, and men, simple laymen, sat in small meetings to pray, and revival swept the whole nation. Brothels closed, clubs closed, entertainment places closed, hospitals were turned into churches because men prayed. Hallelujah. In Alexander Dowie's days, they tell you the story. They said that there was a time Zion, Illinois became the healthiest city in the United States. And it was already spoken of that in Zion people don't fall sick. When a child was growing up, their parents would tell them, don't become a doctor. Why? Because Alexander Dowie is alive. Doctors left hospitals and started plumbing because it was easier to make money out of plumbing than treating people. Why? Because a man with a certain anointing came and gave the devil hell over sickness and we're living in a time where anything medicinal now is wealthy. Everything medicinal creates money. How many nurses are imported in the United Kingdom alone? How many doctors are imported? How many doctors are flown into nations? How many doctors are hard to get? How many doctors do we take months and weeks and years to get to because if you don't get to that guy he's the only guy who can cut your belly a certain way he's the only one who can operate your brain a certain way and i'm not saying that i'm against doctors but a time lived one time in human history where doctors started treating and they became plumbers because a certain man was healing people by the holy ghost men in church history men like alexander Dowie, he was arrested by the government of the united states and they say that he was practicing medicine without a license they were not arguing that his God does heal, no. They just had a problem that his God is healing and he does not have a healing license. And the Spirit remains among you. I say the Spirit remains among you. And that is why I talk to the doctors that are present. That may God put something on you. That you enter a hospital room and you say, instead of cutting you, I'm going to give you a master cutter. You lay hands on them and say, in the mighty name of Jesus, I command that cancer, wherever it is hidden, I command it to come out. Why? Because the spirit remaineth among you. I say the spirit remaineth among you. When Smith Wigglesworth landed in the United States off the ship, 
immediately he found a woman with a goiter and he slapped it off and the woman's skin was healed to normal and he said I've come to heal Americans he came with a message because he had encountered a living God not because God had prophesied the coming of Smith Hugglesworth but because he was a man who was ready to evoke the faith of God to work in his own time and that is what I'm trying to tell you that whether there's a prophetic move there's a revival coming or not you can move God by your faith so he says without faith it is impossible possible to please God. Hora Kotelepa. A. A. Allen. That man that used to speak sicknesses of men and mention what they are and crippled people would start recollecting themselves from nothing they bring a very crippled person from head to toe and the legs and hands start stretching out and they walk out normal and in that time it was a normal event because they were sure God was even ready to do more than they expected Men used to minister and halos of light come over their head and there are cameras that show the Branhams doing that. Rings of clouds used to come in their own meetings and it was evident everywhere that God was somewhere. Fires used to catch tents but they were not consuming. One time one of those revivalists, he asked God for people to come and receive God and they refused and he prayed and when he prayed a fire caught his tent. But the fire was not a consuming fire. And so they came to burn out the fire because they thought some people were getting burned. And when they reached there, they received Jesus. The power of God comes through them and salvation hits them. When they go up the tent where they were seeing that fire, they did not find even a single light of flame on it. Why? God put a fire on a building because he needed to catch the attention of men. Azusa Street Revival, William Samuel, on Bonabray Street, he gets behind shoe boxes and it starts praying for minutes and men get slain as they are passing the streets. They don't even know that there's a man of God there but if they're going through that city with horses and carriages, the moment they get to Bonabray Street, the Spirit of God sweeps them off their horses and they are carried in and they are saying for you, it doesn't matter where you're coming from, yes he's a lost traveler going places with transaction but God needed you and the God who made you pass on Bonabray had an encounter with you and that is how the Azusa Street Revival was passed. Somebody believed God and somebody prayed. Sarabakata. Human responsibility. In that time they were not debating whether it's right to speak in tongues or not. Because men were not speaking in tongues because they were being constructed and structured in the order of speaking in tongues. No. As they are praying and fasting, as they are believing God, something just comes out of a man. And a man finds himself speaking unknown tongues. And God says, so my spirit remaineth among you. It does remain among you. That same spirit that raised Christ from the dead. Woo! He says, that same spirit remaineth among you. Why are you still asking for rental money? Oh, woman of God, I wish something encounters you this evening. You will realize that there's a certain anointing where you'll never look for rent another day. Another woman generally spoken of, she was preaching one day and a fire lantern hit her face and it burnt the whole face. And when he did, she went on a piano as people were laughing and scoffing, saying, look at the stupid evangelist, which was telling us about Jesus. He has gotten burnt on the stage as she's preaching. As men were laughing, she went on a piano and started singing, blessed be the Lord that healeth me. Blessed be the Lord that healeth me. As blood is dripping on the face and the skin is torn off. Blessed be the Lord that healeth me. And the story is given as she was singing. Her skin started to restore back as of a child. And in a few minutes, her skin was back to normal. And those that saw it, all of them gave their lives to 
God. That is what I'm trying to say. May God provoke something in your spirit that men will observe and say, I want to receive God as my personal Lord and Savior without you speaking. But the anointing of God and the operation of the spirit that remaineth among you has been provoked. And now we provoke him again by prayer. He's just looking for somebody who's ready to believe. In Luke chapter 18 verses 1, the Bible says he spake a parable unto them to this end that men ought to always pray and not faint. He spoke a parable to this end. In other words, whatever he was speaking was that to the end men will know that men ought to always pray and not to faint. Men ought to always pray and not to give up and not to give in and not to become weak. He's saying there was in a city a judge. The Bible says, which feared not God, neither regarded man. And there was a widow in that city. And she came unto him saying, avenge me of my adversaries. And he would not for a while. But after he said within himself, though I fear not God, nor regard man, Yet because this widow troubles me, I will avenge her least by continual coming she weary me. God is saying this parable was to the end that men ought to pray and not to cease. And not grow weary. And not faint. And the Bible says, and the Lord said, hear what the unjust judge said. And he says, and shall not God avenge his own elect? Shall he not revive his own? Shall he not form his own? Shall he not move in his own? Which cry day and night unto him, though he bear along with them. He says, I tell you that he will avenge, he will revive, he will change, he will uphold. He will bring that thing speedily. Nevertheless, he says, when the Son of God shall come, when the Son of Man cometh, shall he find that kind of faith on us? When God comes, when Jesus comes, when he comes to evade people, will he find people who are ready to pray until they see what they have believed for. Yes, I'm sovereign. But if an unjust judge can judge a woman's case because she's wearing him with prayer and he says, look, I'm not unjust. I am the just one. That means I will not even let you be wary. Are you hearing me? But I'm trying to tell you to this end that I want you to cultivate a life that prays through something until you know that you have it. That is what happened to Wesley. Some of you know the story. After many years of ministry and his Bible school, he goes as a missionary, comes back about three or so years after and goes to his spiritual authority, his spiritual father. And then his spiritual father asks him, do you have proof? Wesley, that the life of God resides in the inside of you. That same life that raised Christ from the dead. And Wesley, after long thought, he said, I cannot answer that. And Wesley separated himself in that time as it is written. That he went aside and prayed. And he said to God, give me that sin. That when I have it, I shall know that I have it. And that is the voice that revives Europe. That is the voice that is behind the awakening of God's people. Because a man was ready to receive something that when he has it, he knows that he has it. Somebody shout Amen. And now it's no longer God wanting to move. He is already made up to move. He's saying, when the Son of Man shall come, will he find faith on earth? Will he find somebody who is ready to believe him? Will he find somebody who is ready to pray for it and ask for it and receive it? Because it's available. It's available. He says the spirit of that covenant still remains among you. He's saying, will I find a man with enough faith to get it, to lambano it, to receive it? Will I find somebody who can pray and get this thing? Will he find? If he can, if he can, this world is going to become so small. He says that the fervent prayer of a righteous man, the honest, continued, James 5, 16 amplified, he says the honest, heartfelt, continued prayer, he says of a righteous man, makes tremendous power available. He calls it dynamic in its own working. He called it the continuous, the honest, heartfelt, continuous prayer. And then, 
when he gets into the Haggai testimony and prophecy. And Paul finally understands it. Paul read Haggai and understood Haggai. And then he says in Hebrews chapter 12 verses 25. He says, see that you refuse not him that speaketh. In other words, this is not about him moving. This is about you choosing to receive or refuse. He said, see that you receive not him that speaketh. For if they escape not who refused him that spake on earth, much more shall not we escape if we turn away from him that speaketh from heaven. Listen, verse 26, he takes us back in Haggai. He says, whose voice then shook the earth. Then in Haggai, then when he says, I shall set the earth, I shall set the heavens, I shall set the dry land. Now he's saying that one, whose voice shook the earth then in Haggai. He says, but now he has promised saying, yet once more I set not the earth only but also the heaven and this word yet once more signifies the removing of those things that are second as of the things that are made that the things which cannot be second may remain he says like i spoke and shook the earth now this time again i'm going to shake but i'm not only going to set the earth i'm going to set the heaven also again you have the choice to take it or refuse it but i'm ready and there is a man there's a woman that is ready for it and he says when this one comes it is going to check the things that are made that those things which cannot be second may remain this one is bringing eternal things this one is bringing pillars that are going to be planted that cannot be shaken by anybody or anything in other words the move that is coming in the last time it is so permanently eternal that whatever god places on your life it shall never be an old story it shall remain for a monument and a mark like the men of old left their marks too god is trying to say that you're going to make a mark with this that's why i came to provoke you for more than rent I came to provoke you for more than a job. I came to provoke you for more than a child. I came to provoke you for more than a husband. I came to provoke you for more than a wife. I came to provoke you for more than a Canadian visa, for more than a US passport. I came to provoke you. I came to provoke you. I came to provoke you. I came to provoke you for more than that. Because he says, the spirit that makes you above that, he says, it is available. He remaineth among you. And now, for the new creation, he is in you. To this end was this proverb, that men ought to always pray and not cease. Open your mouth and pray. Open your mouth and pray. You take me. Forget anything, forget everything, forget where you're coming from, forget what you're going through, forget what was said of you and what you have said, forget who wronged you and who did, forget whether you ate or you did, forget whether you have rent or not, forget whether you have transport or not, forget whether they love you or chuck you, forget, forget that, forget whether you're beautiful or not, forget whether you're smart or not, forget whether you came driving or walking, forget and just open your mouth and place on God a demand that is so eternal because he has said when a man's faith provokes me when human responsibility comes to the things touching my purpose he says concerning the works of me command ye me I will move I will touch I will change I will uplift I will uphold I will revive I will reform I will anoint I will move because the spirit remains among you and in you open your mouth and pray come on pray I gave my life to the potent You take me to mold me to you I gave my life to the poor and You call 
I gave my life to you. Pour us in. Somebody raise your voice and talk to God. You paid me. Yeah. You mold me. You use me. You feel me. I gave my life to you. The poor of hell. You call me. You call me. You lead me up beside me. Cause I gave my life for you. For the hell. Cause I gave my life to the poor of hell. You call me, yeah. you mold me, yeah. you lead me up beside me. Cause I gave my life to the poor. If you can't believe God for it, believe it for your children. Believe it for your time. Believe it your believe it for your children. Believe it for your time. Believe it for your nation. Believe it for your generation. But somebody has got to believe God. Sababa <laughs> 
It's working in us. The word of God is working in our life. The word of God is working in everything we see. The word of God is working in every land we step. The Bible says the spirit remains. The spirit remains in us. The spirit remains among us. The spirit that does this thing has been given, which is the seal of the promise that we are filled with to the day of redemption. We have not received the spirit of bondage again to fear, but we have received the spirit that is of power, love, and sound mind. The Spirit of God is in the inside of us. I have not seen, he has not had, has not entered the hearts of men. The things that he has prepared for those that love him. But he has revealed it. He's not revealing. He has revealed it. He's not revealing. He has revealed it unto us by his spirit. For the spirit searching all the things. Yeah, the deep things of God. And he sounds out the bottomless things of God. The Bible says to us, God has unveiled and revealed these things through his spirit. For the Holy Spirit is diligent. He's working 
an insider to reveal the divine counsel, the things hidden beyond human scrutiny, they are revealed in your spirit. The spirit remains. The spirit is here. The spirit of possible is here. The spirit of healing is here. The spirit of revival is here. The spirit of reformation is here. The spirit of wisdom is here. The spirit of understanding. Catch it. Catch it. Catch it. Get in contact with it. Receive. Get a hold of it with your spirit. Pray until you know that you have received it. Because it's available. It's available. It's available. It's available. It's available. It's available. Don't say God revive us. He has sent revival. He has revived you by His Spirit. The Bible says He sent His Spirit to revive us. And that Spirit remains in us. Remains. He abides permanently in you. Place a demand on that Spirit. And the Spirit of the Sovereign Lord. You are mine for miracles. You are mine for signs. You are mine for wonders. You are mine for vision. You are mine for experience. You are mine to change nations. You are mine to heal homes. You are mine to change this world. You are mine. You are mine. The Spirit is available. Pray like He's available. A demand of what is available. Choose your path on what is available. Define your course on what remains, on who remains. Oh, he's shaking the things that might be second of the things that are made that we might receive and keep the things that cannot be second and shall not be removed. The things that must remain, those things that can't be shaken, those are ours. 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 And the spirit remains. The spirit remains. The spirit remains. Is in you. In him you live. Move and have your own being. How God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Spirit and with power and he went about doing good and healing all which are oppressed of the devil for God was with him that spirit in the same that raised Christ from the dead now resides in the east out of you bless and demand on him for your generation bless and demand on him for your nation bless and demand on him for Africa bless and demand on him for the world bless and demand on him for the islands Bless a demand on him for the highways and the byways. Bless a demand on him for the lakes. Bless a demand on him for the rivers. Bless a demand on him for the media. Bless a demand on him for the economy. Bless a demand on him for the politics. Bless a, bless a demand on him for your society, for the social. Bless a demand on him for medicine. Bless a demand on him. Bless a demand on him for healing. Bless a demand on him for delivery. Bless a demand on him. But delivering beyond him, something bigger than him. Something bigger than your name, something bigger than your relation, something bigger than your culture, something bigger than your tribe, something bigger than your ethnicity, something bigger, something bigger, something bigger than, something bigger than, something bigger than your life. Hey! These are the days, these are the times, this is the season, this is the month, this is the hour. Rakatarapa. Oh, 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 You know what you want. You know what you want. You know what you want. Place a demand on it. Receive it. Receive it. 
receive it. It's available. He's available. He's among us. He's in us. Ayaraba Baba. Sakapata. Rekekereta. He's ready. The Spirit of God is ready. He's ready. He's just waiting for your responsibility. Human responsibility. He's waiting for your responsibility. He's waiting for your responsibility. Take charge. Pray. The fervent prayer. The heartfelt prayer. The continuous prayer. Of a righteous man, the Bible says, availeth much power. The power is dynamic in nature. It makes tremendous power available. And that power is dynamic in its working. You have the Holy Spirit. Come on, pray. Right now as you're praying, you are availing tremendous power. And that power is dynamic in its working. The Lord says the more you continue to pray, the more power avails. The more you pray, the more power avails. The more you pray, the more power avails. The more you pray, the more power avails. Dynamic in nature. There is a prayer you're making, and it is revival the revival of Asia. There is a prayer that you're making, and it's going to put you on the front line of the move of God in Africa, of the move of God in Europe, of the move of God in the United States, of the move of God in the islands, in North and South America. In China, in the most remote parts of the world, your mark is getting fixed. The things that are second of the things that are made are indeed being second. For this time is not only shaking the earth, but is shaking the heaven also. That the things that must remain shall remain that the things that cannot be second may remain God is blessing a man He's blessing a distinction He's blessing a pillar on your life a monument on your story and as long as the earth remains men will talk about you and the God that walked in you women will talk about you and the God that walked in you Sarababa <laughs> Avail much power. And that power heals nation. Hey, receive it, lady. Receive it. It is yours. It is yours. It is yours. It is available. 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 It is yours. Somebody receive it. Somebody take it. Shaba katalapa. Ketelepa. Rakatolo maya. Shaba baba baba yarabaka. Rakataraba yaraba. Shaba baba dereko laba. Hey. Shaba baba baba. Broko tere dere lebo. Take me. You mold me, 
Cause I gave my life to the poor and the dead. Ah, 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 Oh, I will give you all my words. I will give you all my grace. Cause you are. Ba 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 
Branco perere baba, kusara baba baba baba, baba 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 re 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 bo, sara baba. Branca tara baba 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 kase, sara baba re 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 bo bo, re 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 ko sara ba. Listen, nobody can take you there. You have to go there yourself. You got to go there yourself. You got to go there yourself. This is according to your hand. It's according to what you're ready to take. It's according to the responsibility you have over this world in the generation. That is why you'll not die early. Because you have a covenant with God. That is why you'll not die early. Because it's not done with you yet. I'll give you all. 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 Sarah, Baba, 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 I will give you all my praise yeah. You alone, I love to worship You alone, I will be all my praise I will give you all my worship I will give you If you're here and you've never been speaking in tongues, receive it right now. I see the baptism of the Holy Spirit by the evidence of speaking in tongues. Open your mouth. God fills it with another language. Receive it by faith. By faith. By faith. By faith. That's it. That's it. I could sing of your love forever. I could sing of your love forever. I would sing of your love forever. I could sing of your love forever. I could sing of your love. I could sing of your love forever. I could sing of your love forever. I could sing of your love. Forever. I, could your love forever. Hey. I could sing of your love forever. I could sing of your love. I could 
The wisdom of God, 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 the power of God, the spirit of God, the oh my. Holy Spirit, we thank you. Sarababa you are the fire in me oh you are the power that works in me yeah. you are my ever present help oh holy spirit I My ever present help, oh Lord, Holy Spirit, I adore. Oh, you are the fire with me. You are the power that works in me. Yeah. You are my ever present help. Holy Spirit, I adore. Precious Holy Ghost, I worship You. I worship You. Precious Holy Ghost, You have Your name. The 
here and you're not born again and you want to receive Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior repeat this word after me say Lord Jesus tonight I receive you as my Lord and Savior I give you my heart I give you my life I give you all that I am I receive your Lordship tonight my life is changed forever. Amen. God bless you. The message you have just heard was brought to you by Fenero Ministries International. For more information, contact us on telephone number 041-466-4291 or email us at fenerocompala at gmail.com. You can also find us on the web at www.fenero.org. Or better still, feel free to join us every Thursday for our weekly fellowship at Uma Multipurpose Hall from 5 p.m. to 8 p.m. You can also catch the live stream at livestream.com slash Fenero. Fenero. Make manifest.